injury of which nerves A to C is most likely responsible for the deformity shown in the picture. The deformity shown here results from an upper brachial plexus injury that follows excessive displacement of the head to the opposite side and depression of the shoulder on the same side. And this might occur in this infant because of difficult labor. And this results in traction, stretching and tearing of C5 and 6 roots. In adults, similar injury might follow a blow or a fall on the shoulder especially from a motorcycle accident, resulting in separation of the head and shoulder and stretching the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. You can see here a dissection of the roots of the brachial plexus, roots, trunks of the brachial plexus, the supraclavicular portion of the brachial plexus. You can see the roots from C5 to T1, and C5, 6 roots form the upper trunk, C7 forms the middle trunk, C8 and T1 form the lower trunk of the brachial plexus, and these roots are located in between scalinus anterior and scalinus medius muscles and the posterior triangle of the neck. You will remember that the suprascapular nerve arises from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. Other nerves containing fibers derived from C5 and C6 are also affected, such as nerve to subclavius, which is not that important, but the important nerves are the musculocutaneous and axillary nerves. Therefore, the position of the limb will be characteristic. It may hang by the side, adducted and medially rotated by the unopposed pectoralis major muscle. Adducted, as you can see, and medially rotated. The forearm will be extended and pronated because the action of biceps is lost. Biceps is supplied by musculocutaneous nerve, which is affected here. Axillary nerve that is affected will affect abduction, thus the uh, limb is adducted at the shoulder. So mainly shoulder abduction, flexion, and supination of the forearm are lost. The position of the upper limb is likened to that of a porter or waiter indicating their desire for a tip. So it is also called waiter's tip position. Upper lesions of the brachial plexus are also called herb Duchenne palsy. In addition to the loss of motor function, there might be an area of loss of sensation on the lateral side of the arm and forearm, especially if both C5 and 6 are affected. Injury of which nerves A to C? is most likely responsible for the deformity shown in the picture. The deformity is produced by a lower brachial plexus injury. It is less common than upper brachial plexus injuries, and it is also called Klumpke palsy. This results from excessive abduction of the arm, as in during labor, as in, in this case of a newborn, excessive abduction of the arm, may also occur when a person falls from a height grasping something to save himself. Note that T1 lesions may also occur because of a cervical rib. In Klumke's palsy, the first thoracic spinal nerve is usually torn, and thus affecting the lower cord of the brachial plexus. The intrinsic muscles of the hands are affected, since this is the myotome of the intrinsic muscles of the hand, and so the hand looks like a claw due to hyperextension of the metacarpophalangeal joints and flexion of the interphalangeal joints because of the loss of action of the interossei and lumbricals which are supplied by the ulnar nerve which carries fibers from T1 to supply these muscles. There will also be loss of sensation on the medial side of the arm, especially if C8 is also damaged. This is a demonstration of the action of the lumbricals and entrosii and what happens when these muscles are not innervated. You will remember that the lumbricals and entrosii, they flex the metacarpophalangeal joints and extend the interphalangeal joint. In a claw hand, where the lumbricals and entrosii are not in action, there will be the reverse. That's to say, there will be hyperextension of the metacarpophalangeal joint and there will be at the same time flexion of the interphalangeal 
joints. Extensor digitorum, which is unopposed by lumbricals and enterosei, therefore will produce extension of the metacarpophalangeal joints. Usually, the enterosei and lumbricals, they act on the extensor expansion to cause extension of the interphalangeal joints as well. Flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus, unopposed by the lumbricals and enterosei, will produce flexion of the interphalangeal joints.